we both have been given so much because of these animals, right? Mm -hmm. Like we're blessed. I told you today, I'm eating some of the best fish tacos I ever had <laughs> overlooking the Pacific Ocean in Malibu. Yeah. Like, how did I get here, right? Yeah. You know what my first job was? Mm -mm. I was six years old, Rocky's Italian Delicatessen in Lodi, where all the old mobsters used to hang out. And I'd Love go that. in there. <laughs> and I go in there one day and I ask Rocky for a job. Mm -hmm. And he's laughing and all the old men are laughing. He's, all right, what will you do? I say, anything. Mm -hmm. Up, sweep, take care of your dog, whatever you want. He said, okay. This is my obsession with food, how far it goes back. And I never knew at the time why all the old men in there were laughing, but I understand now. <laughs> he said, okay, how much do you want to be paid? I said, I only want to be paid with ham and cheese sandwiches. <laughs> <laughs>so we had a little hiccup here in the studio i've got a guest he's right there um but i'm going to tell, tell you something first larry crone is a guy i met on the internet a long time ago and um it sounds almost like a dating site. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> i'm so wrong but um he came out here from all the way from kentucky and um the, the third camera doesn't work so people will not know we're in the same studio until i switch over and show you like that make sure that they know that you're actually there I'm so here. Um, so it's going to keep going back and forth. I'm going to put my finger on this one. I'm going to talk and I'm going to go over there and then you're going to talk, but, um, let's just, let's just get started. I wish we had the other camera tomorrow. We're going to do another podcast and I'll have the second camera, third camera. Um, what, what's going on? I mean, we have, we've been talking back and forth online so long that I th today, I think we said everything we need to say all day today. I know. Right. It's, it's crazy. Yeah. And I didn't even tell you, you got to move that microphone forward a little tiny bit and kind of, there you go. Yeah. How's that? Yeah. That's perfect. Better? Yeah, because you get that nice voice. We got to get. We I think we talked about way too much stuff. There's nothing left to talk yeah, about. Yeah. Um, what you know? What I want to you you lived in Lodi, New Jersey. Yeah. Right. And born and Lodi, raised. Born and raised, actually. Right. Yeah. And I lived in Hasbrook Heights, the first place I lived, which yeah, is that blows me away. Neighboring towns. We never knew that about each other, yeah. which is really funny. So you in Lodi, you grew up. You went to high school, high school, and everything yeah. right there. Mm -hmm. What made you move? You went from Lodi to. <laughs> Douglas, Arizona. <laughs> from from culture to culture, right? <laughs> yeah, I went straight to the Mexican border. First time I ever left the New Jersey, New York area. I had never really been out of the area before. Wow. Mm -hmm. And w w was it was for work, right? It was. And you were work. Do you, do you, can you talk about your work? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I, okay, because it's our secrets. We won't go off. No, talk about. <laughs> listen, I could talk about anything now. I'm retired. Okay, yeah, good. Yeah. <laughs> Caught you at the right time. So you went to work in kind of law enforcement kind of yeah, work, right? Yeah. And that was your first real job. Sure. Per, per se. Kind of, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We both had a little speckled past. But um, so when you got into that, what made you, you, you would work for the Department of Corrections? No, I didn't. Oh, sorry. It's kind of a long story, but I'll okay. make it short. Okay. I didn't, I wasn't federal agent material prior to that. Let's just say that. Okay. I lived a very different life, uh -huh. right? When I was in high school, I started dating my wife. We met in the vice principal's office. She worked in there on her free classes and her free time. Mm -hmm. And I was always ordered in there <laughs> on my not free time. That's how we met, really. Wow. And so... Like we started dating before, you know, the, our first date was actually our senior prom. That's the first time I took her out. Wow. She was very straight and narrow. I was not. And I was doing manual labor and a lot of things I shouldn't have been doing. That's just what I was doing. And I knew right away that I was going to want to stay with her mm -hmm. for forever. I knew that. I just knew it. Wow. So I knew I had to make a change. And I knew part of that was I had to get out of that area. Mm. I did. So I went from one extreme to the other. Yeah. I went from non-law enforcement way of living. To, I said, well, I'm going to, mm -hmm. I think I could be good at that because I kind of know both sides of it, right? <laughs> so I started applying for all kinds of police, everything I could apply for. But in the Northeast, it's very, very tough to get on with any kind of law enforcement, unless you really have a connection. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't going to get help in that area, right. you know? So one day I was going to the post office to mail off an application for Baltimore City Police. And I saw a friend of mine that I went to high school with that was an immigration inspector. And he said, hey, if you can get in with the Border Patrol, it's federal. It's the way to go. And I didn't even know what the Border Patrol was. Mm -hmm. And I said, all right, I'll see what I can do. I wound up going through the whole process. And, you know, it's when they first started doing this expedited hirings. They needed so many people back then. That was in the 90s? Yeah, that was in the early 90s. Mm -hmm. 
I had to go into Manhattan one day, which I bitched about, even though it was only eight <laughs> miles from <laughs> right, my house. Right, right? And I yeah. had people from all over the country mm-hmm. there. And they gave the test for 75 people took the test from all over the country. Mm-hmm. And I was one of five that passed. So then fast forward the process. I wind up out there and uh, we got married a year into me being out there. And it was major, major culture shock. I mean, it was wow. going from... Lodi, New Jersey, to Douglas, Arizona, on the Mexican border. Yeah. It was tough at first, for especially for my wife, because we had no one out there, you know. And then the oh. Border Patrol becomes your family. Everyone who's in the same boat, you all become very close. So yeah. it, it, it worked out. It worked out well. That's it, It's interesting. I got to tell you this. I didn't tell you this. We've had so many talks on the phone and, like, just today, like, going out and hanging out. The one thing I really admired about you, and I was find something. I don't really like to make friends, new friends, because I think I've— too, too busy in my life. The reason, what I really like about you and I still admire about you is your, your passion for your wife and your passion for life. You're just, you know, I mean, you're a great dog trainer. I mean, for sure. sure. But beyond that, you've got that character. And the, the one thing is the love for your wife. I always think that that is like the coolest thing. You talk about her all the time. You know, you're a very public figure. You don't need to do that. Um, I mean, and I think we share that because I'm madly in love with my wife. And you've known her for 30 years. I've known mine for 30 years. It's so rare to see that. So like kudos to you for, for, you for having that because it says so much about your character, right? Well, I've done plenty wrong, right? And I'm in a position now, and we talked about this a lot today, mm-hmm. Robert. I have a really good life. I really do. I have nothing I should complain about. I'm very blessed. But literally everything I have is because of her. Everything. I'd have nothing without her. Mm. Now, I don't take myself very serious. I joke around <laughs> a lot. Yeah. I'm inappropriate all the time. And I drive her crazy. Mm. Like, I'm hard to live with mm. because she's, like my daughter says, she's raising three kids. I'm the worst <laughs> out of the three kids, right? So I don't talk to her like this all the mm. time. But mm. it's the truth. Everything yeah. I have, like, she really straightened me out. Yeah. You know, and I have two, un- my kids are my life. Mm. And she's just a phenomenal mom. She's a phenomenal wife. And, and yeah. that's why I have what I have today. Yeah. So when you see people, you know, with, with all the love, some of the hate's going to come too. Sure. And so one thing I've noticed about all the people on the hating side, they don't have that. They're missing a lot in their yeah. lives. And I never let that bother me. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Because yeah. I kind of feel sorry for them. Yeah. You know? but, yeah. I mean, you do. You have a great life. I mean, you're very successful at what you do. You're sure. very well known. You're very well respected. And, um, and I think that comes from the core of who you are. And again, you know, we talked about, we both kind of did some things that were gray in our, in our past, speckled past, but the, the idea is I, I just, and again, we're not even getting on dog training. It's just that core of the person that I always admire. And that is when I see somebody who has that special something, and th- th- there's a characteristic because I think it carries through into your dog training. You sure. really love dogs. I do. You know, and that's very different because a lot of people I meet in dog training or talk to, they're there. It's a business thing, right? Okay, you know, I couldn't be a mechanic. I couldn't be an airplane, you know, pilot. So I'm a, I'm a dog trainer. And that's not, that's, I think you and I share that in common. Yeah. Like you just have a passion for dogs. What made you, like, who was the first dog you ever trained? Like why? What happened? The first dog that me and my wife got together, okay? It was a, uh, my buddy who was a senior agent, great guy. He had a chocolate lab, and the border collie next door jumped the fence, got her pregnant. I was looking for a Rottweiler at the time. Mm -hmm. He told me, hey, I got these Rottweiler puppies. You want a puppy? (laughs) I said, do you really? Yes. I went to check them out, and I was like, man, that's that's like the Rottweiler (laughs) do. But when you see a puppy, you want a puppy, what happens, right? So she had a lot of puppies. I wanted a male. I made them take all the males out. And all the puppies were screaming to get back to mama, except this one little puppy went off and he was just sitting there by his side. And um, we, I said, I want him. And I took him. My wife didn't know I was getting a puppy. And what had happened was my brother was living at us at the time. We had no money. We were broke. We were living in a one-bedroom apartment, you know. And my brother was running from the bookies in New Jersey. Mm-hmm. I hope he doesn't get mad at me saying that. But he was. <laughs> he called me from a payphone in Daytona Beach one day. He's like, I'm out of money. I had to send him a bus ticket. He was living with us. And him and my wife were so bored, that's going to create a lot of jokes. I already know. That's okay. <laughs> they made this little paper dog 
when I was at work and they named him Ben and I came home and it was under the table. So I got this puppy and he spent all day with me working at the border patrol and all the agents were playing with, he was just all over with me. And it was my wife's first day of work at a new job in Arizona. And she had like the day from hell. Like it was, I had this puppy and I'm waiting for her. We weren't allowed to have puppies by the way in this apartment. <laughs> and she didn't get home till late at night. And she came home hysterical crying because she had such a bad day. When she was walking up the stairs, I was holding this puppy and she saw it. And she just stopped and she took it. And that puppy started licking her tears. Oh. And that that was it. It was over. We named him Ben. And like a lot of people do today, we destroyed that puppy. We just made him so mentally weak. That was our child. Mm. That's all. That's what we had, right? Mm. We completely destroyed him. We couldn't leave him for two minutes to go without him screaming. I wasn't allowed to have a puppy in this apartment. One day the super knocks on the door. He goes, hey, I was told you had a puppy here. Because he used to have to, all the old people, all the snowbirds from up mm -hmm. north would want to see him every day. And I said, yeah, I do. And he goes, can I see him? I said, sure. He came in, he started playing with the puppy. He said, all right, have a nice day, you know. <laughs> uh, but about five, six months old, I knew we had to do something. Because it got bad. He was yeah. suffering. And I started working with our first trainer. And that trainer had the best behaved dogs I had ever seen. And that's what got me interested in the behavior. I didn't care about the fancy stuff, mm -hmm. not even the obedience, none of that. I just wanted a dog that behaved like that. If he told him to go get something, he did it. And I got fascinated. Like, we did horrible in the training. But that just gave me more incentive to succeed at it, you mm -hmm. know. So I really learned as much as I could from him. And then I, I just continued. And shortly after that, we got our first Rottweiler puppy. Mm -hmm. um, because of where we lived, I used to work nights and shifts mm. and the home invasions down there were brutal, man. They would bust into your house and, and do really horrible things mm. to people. And I was so scared of leaving my wife every night. That's how we got into Rottweilers. Mm. And I just got obsessed with it and yeah. I continued to learn as much as I could. Then when I started training, I trained dogs for free for a long time. Yeah. I because you that. can't charge someone to train if you don't, you're yeah. making mistakes. You yeah. know what I mean? Some people can though. Yeah, <laughs> it's a, a big lot. business on that now. <laughs> so I trained a lot of dogs for a long time and didn't charge people money because mm. I just I wanted to get good at it so bad. And each dog, I made tons of mistakes, but I got a little better each yeah. time. And then each dog we got got a lot better because I knew where I messed up with my last dog. Yeah, you, you built know? on it. Sure, absolutely. But yeah. you're kind of you're kind of like me. You're an obsessive personality. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm like that too. And it, it's it's a bad. It's not. I'm not proud of it. Right. You know, because it, with anything I do, I just go way over the top. And if I'm not good at it, I stop. Like I'm, I'm a total weakling like that. Like I don't want to be unsuccessful because we talked about working out mm -hmm. and we had something similar because when you said that, that you were this tall, lanky, skinny, I, I mean, I was geeky. I mean, yeah. I was, a, I was a dork, um, but I was obsessive about working out sure. and you said that's what you did, right? When, so you were, when did that happen? How you were in high school or something? I graduated high school at six foot one, 135 pounds. I was skin and bones. Wow. So when I decided I was going to gain weight, I, I stopped playing basketball. I stopped boxing. I stopped moving. Mm -hmm. And I just started hitting the gym two or three hours a day and eating. Mm -hmm. And I was killing myself. And nothing was happening, you know. Yeah. Um, I got a little stronger for a while, but I wasn't getting bigger. And I knew there had to be a better way. Because one day I looked around the gym, and after being there for a long time, and it was all the same people. Mm -hmm. And nobody looked different. <laughs> and everybody was doing the same thing. Yeah. Right? I talked about this in a video a while ago. And I said, there's got to be a different way. So me, I always try to do the opposite. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay, this is what I'm going to do. Mentally, it was tough. I'd go to the gym. I'd work one body part. And in 15 minutes, I'd go hard and I'd be done. And after that 15 minutes, I would go sit on the couch in the gym and relax. Mm -hmm. Then I'd go downstairs to the pizza place and I'd stuff myself. <laughs> when all my friends were going to play basketball, I'd still go to the courts with them. Yeah. But I would go with a Whopper combo meal and a large pizza and just eat. <laughs> And I gained 95 pounds in two years. Wow. Yeah. So. But when you grew up, were you like, I, okay, so I'll tell you, I, I don't think we've talked about this in a past podcast. When I grew up, I came, I came here back from Germany because we lived in Rhode Island, went to Germany, came to Jersey. Mm -hmm. And in Jersey, I remember walking down. Remember, did you remember Lovey's Pizza? And had, yeah, absolutely. Okay. That was my first Dude, job. That's so crazy. That was my first Are you job. Kidding I me? swear to God, I was 13 years old or 12 years old. I was wa washing dishes at Lovey's Pizza. So there's no doubt we've been in there at the same time. We used that's, to go to Lovey's all the time. Loved Lovey's Pizza. The best pizza, right? And right down the street was Chicken Delight with the orange chicken. Chicken which Delight. Was phenomenal, yeah, yeah. man. Oh, that's so yeah. funny. That's That's that was my first job, but I was such a geek, right? I remember I went to this Catholic school, Corpus Christi, I 
know if you remember yeah. the church. Okay, so yeah. that's where I went to. That's where my mom somehow got us in there because we were living with my aunt in one bedroom in a house yeah. on, on, on Franklin Avenue. And um, I was such a geek. Eddie Brazil beat me up every freaking day. I was a geek. I was a total geek all the way through into high school, junior high school. When we moved to Florida, I tried to reinvent myself. But I don't think you were. You are probably like a cool guy because you were athletic, right? I wasn't athletic. Yeah, but I was still geeky looking and skinny, yeah. you know. I, I was yeah, funny and did things. And, <laughs> yeah, you know, but I was so. like really geeky. I was like, it was horrible for me. I just, I, I hated my childhood in a lot of ways because of that. Right. That I was such a geek. And I, I couldn't do anything. I was like, please don't beat me up. And I was... And then I got into martial arts. I started did my first class at the rec center in in, in Hasbro Heights, and we went to to Florida. And I really got into martial arts, started lifting weights, and I was always obsessed with it. But I would never gain weight until I was in my twenties. Sure. When I found that lifting weight, and I lifted weights since I was fourteen, fifteen years old. Mm-hmm. But I really got into it. Did you do you did you see do you see ever now like people who look up to you? And I, I mean, it's hard to say that people look up to us. We're the older guys, sure. pretty much out there. Um, in social media, I think we're probably the oldest ones out there. <laughs> I guess, it. yeah. But people kind of look up to you. Do you ever like give a shout out and help you know, some some people who have issues like that? Or three hundred sixty five days a year. You do right, hundred percent. Because I think it's so important. Like back when we were young, we didn't have anybody really to look up to. Like I mean, I looked up to Arnold Schwarzenegger, and I, and I met him a couple times at Gold's Gym, and it was not really like a big deal after having known a lot of celebrities and Bruce Lee. So those were my idols when I was growing up. But nowadays, you know, it's, I think it's more realistic because when sometimes, you know, some kid will ask me questions about dog training. I just, I was on a podcast and this guy said, you know, if I can affect 100,000 people with my dog training, I think that's a great thing. And I said, well, if I can only affect one, that's even better. And those little messages, and Janet will sit with me, I tear up when I get a message from somebody overseas that says, you helped me with my dog. And I, I'm going to tear up now. I want, I want to hear your side of that because I think you get that. Yeah, yeah. Um every single day and that's why i've never been hurt by giving away something for free Mm. it always comes back somehow right yeah and so i don't post them every now and then i'll post a message on someone's dog but i don't talk about it i don't show it i don't need the attention from it the people that give me those messages do enough and i don't i rarely show my wife and every now and then i get one that i have to show her Mm -hmm. and she'll be like jeez like i don't know how you comprehend deal with that every day because some of it's it's very deep deep very deep yeah and for me that's the ultimate reward yeah it's just the ultimate um we touched on it a little bit earlier we had trained a dog a few years ago for a wounded soldier we got a puppy we kept it a year and a half we trained it we gave it to him not for pt a very 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 capable human mm-hmm. being very high profile human being and we gave him this dog and the reason that happened was there was a trainer that was supposed to be doing that for him with this organization to do it for free. And they asked me to be part of it if I would help out with the training. I said, of course, I'm always going to do something for a soldier. Well, I never heard back from them. And then over a year later, maybe two years later, this soldier called me, not knowing I even knew about it, and said, how much would you charge me to train a dog for me? You know, I, mm-hmm. you know, he's a double amputee. He, yeah. He's a high-profile individual. His family's left home. I said, whoa, I know who you are. I said, why don't you, you were supposed to have a dog to make a long story short. He did get a dog and also got taken for $29,000 with the dog that was so out of control. I had to give back. So that bothered me. Yeah. I confronted the individual that got a little ugly, didn't go public with it. And then I sat my, my wife and kids down and I said, here's the deal. We got to do something. What do you guys think? And they said, let's do it. We got the puppy and we raised it. After a year and a half, Me and my daughter, Sophia, drove it down to where he lives, cross country, spent a few days with the incredible family. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, we're still friends and and they mean the world to me and gave him the dog. And when we left, I sat in the driveway crying like a baby where my little girl's behind me, patting me and hugging me. Dad's going to be okay. Look, Mm -hmm. look, you did a good thing. Look where, and I'm like, I can't do this anymore because I thought I was giving away a trained dog. I wasn't. I felt like I was giving away my dog. Yeah. Right. And so... I want to do stuff for the soldiers, but I couldn't do that again. And that's only one dog at a time over two Mm. years, right? I can't do that. Right. So I got a letter like you're talking about one day from a canine handler. And I can't remember if it was Afghanistan or Iraq. The letter was long and it was, it had me in tears big time. Mm. I don't even like, I have a hard time talking about it. (laughs) And I just showed it to my wife. My wife read it and she said, geez, she 
said, you got to do something for these guys. I was like, what? What can I, I can't train a dog for everyone. And it was very simple to her. She said, just do free seminars for them. Mm. So I was like, you're smoking hot, but you're smart too. <laughs> right. I said, that's a good idea. Uh-huh. And that's when I started doing the seminars for the soldiers. Okay. I didn't even know you do seminars. Yeah, I do. Okay. I do. It stopped with COVID. Okay. But we'll get back to it now to good. where I'll do uh, free seminars just for combat vets. And there's no charge for that or nothing. That. Um, Nelson Hodges, who's my buddy out in Texas, did one with me and hosted at his place. So for me, we both have been given so much because of these animals, right? Mm-hmm. Like we're blessed. I told you today, I'm eating some of the best fish tacos I ever had <laughs> overlooking the Pacific Ocean in Malibu. Yeah. Like how did I get here, right? Yeah. You know what my first job was? Mm-mm. I was six years old, Rocky's Italian Delicatessen in Lodi, where all the old mobsters used to hang out. And I'd Love go that. in there. <laughs> and I go in there one day and I ask Rocky for a job. Mm-hmm. And he's laughing, and all the old men are laughing. He's all right. What will you do? I say anything. Mm -hmm. Up, sweep, take care of your dog, whatever you want. Okay. This is my obsession with food. How far it goes back, and I never knew at the time why all the old men in there were laughing, but I understand now. (laughs) He said, "Okay, how much do you want to be paid?" I said, "I only want to be paid with ham and cheese sandwiches." That was my best paycheck ever to this day. That's what I did, right? So you go from that, and then you go fast forward through my life. And then today, you saw how happy I was. Mm -hmm. Like, I was truly just in in heaven doing that. Um, That's not, that's from my wife pushing me to do this stuff and not. Not, not, not just holding me back, but forcing me to do it when Mm -hmm. there's times I didn't want to do it. Mm -hmm. And then for all the people out there that, you know, sometimes you get a message a nasty from someone, someone makes a video about you. Mm-hmm. You know you've made it when they're making videos about yeah, you, right? that's true. But then you get all these messages from people that are unbelievable, that I'll never share with people because it's too valuable to me. Mm-hmm. And that's what keeps you going. Yeah. And then things like today, you know, I came out two days early for the seminar and got a rental car to come here because I wanted to hang with you. Mm-hmm. We've been talking for a while, and yeah. I, I just instantly connected with you when we started talking. Yeah. And today was everything. Yeah, it was absolutely everything. And so I'm grateful for all the people out there that give us this stuff and especially the soldiers. Yeah. I mean, I, there's nothing I wouldn't do for the military. Sure. I mean, you know, I go, give military discounts to, to people. I just think we overlook police, military, you know, first responders. And we've got, we've come to a really crappy place in our society. Big time. And I, I, I speak about it so publicly that if you don't like the police and you don't like our military, you, you don't like me, and I don't no. like you. No, yeah, you know? absolutely. So you're a big softie inside. Like, I start tearing up hearing your sure. stories, talking about this stuff. And I cry a lot. I do, too. <laughs> <laughs> I cry a lot. You know? Um, but you, you have this other side, and I think that's, like, that's why I started my YouTube channel, because I was helping people making really good living in, in, in Malibu. And I thought, man, like, I'm not overly, like, public about doing stuff for charity, but what I think about is, how can I do something without really doing being so public about it and i think your channel i mean you have some of the most amazing videos on there you're a practical approach you're a no-nonsense kind of guy um i i don't know besides me i don't know anybody else who really does that well you know like 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 you said earlier what people don't understand robert a lot of the people in the dog world especially some of the the bigger fish that spew a lot of negativity Mm -hmm. those videos aren't for the people going to the national championships and IGP. Mm -hmm. They're not for the agility champions. They're for the everyday dog owner that doesn't know what to do. Yeah. They know nothing. Yeah. And so the most basic realistic information really helps these people. Yeah. Right. If you watch my, I was laughing at all this stuff you got set up here. (laughs) I I still do everything on my iPhone in the most unprofessional way. Well, yours works. I got a camera that doesn't work (laughs) over there. (laughs) But when I started doing that, mm-hmm. I couldn't believe people were watching my video. So mm-hmm. my whole goal was just to put something out that I struggled with mm-hmm. that would help the everyday dog owner. Yeah. And when I started doing that, and I was like, whoa, people are watching these videos, mm-hmm. right? And then I started interacting with the audience. I said, you know what, guys, since so many of you are watching them, I'm going to get some nice camera equipment and some editing thing. And they ripped me up. They said, don't. Yeah. We want to still see it just like Raw. this, like this. Yeah. We don't want you to change anything. Don't. And so I've been doing it like that ever since. Mm. Right. But there'll still be people to say, you need a new camera. I was like, I don't mind. I could afford a new camera, but people really want, I think that's 
part of my lore, I guess. I'm so bad with this stuff. <laughs> I'm going to make mistakes. It's mm. going to look awful, but I'm going to be honest. And not everything I do is perfect. Yeah. I don't have a video that I look at where I say, oh, I made a mistake there. I could have mm. done this better. But that's dog training, at least the way I do mm. things. Yeah. But I don't hide it. Right. And But you know, you said something that's important. I think you got, I, I want to correct you on it. You said what we do isn't for the people in IGP and agility and stuff like that. Here's the thing is a lot of people, I mean, and I'm not a competitor in IGP. I did it. I titled my dogs, but I'm nef I'm not, you know, Avi Cohen or, or, or Frank Phillips or, or, or any of these amazing guys that I've talked to, but I have a, a natural approach to things. I'm a good problem solver. And sure. so are you. Yeah. And you know, as well as I know that we can solve problems that some IPO trainers can't solve. And sure. I'm not putting us above them, but I'm saying that I can look at things and see something and you can look at things and see something. So I think there's a lot of, and I do see a lot of people from the sports who, whether it's competitive obedience protection or whatever, that say, hey, your your video really helped me understand this better and you're able to do that too. Sure. You know? Yeah, because a lot of people will look at, at the sport or the event instead mm. of looking at the dog. Right. And the dog is the dog. Yeah, And I don't care if you have the Bichon down the street mm -hmm. or the world champion German Shepherd. It's still a dog. They all learn the same. Yeah, But sometimes, and some of these people are so good at what they do. Like though, some of the people you just named are the people I look up to. Yeah, me these too. people who take dogs to the top level, mm -hmm. dog after dog, mm -hmm. these people blow me away. That's yep. why I, I listen to all those conversations. I try to pick up everything, you mm -hmm. know? Um but they're so ingrained in the sport. And and just like if one of them came to watch us do something with a pet dog, they're mm -hmm. going to see something like, mm -hmm. hey, why don't you try try this? Yeah. And the more eyes you have on things, and sometimes just a completely different perspective. Mm -hmm. I've done some weird things in dog training just because it was, I was stuck. Sure. And some of the weirdest things have worked, worked. really well. Yeah. And, and that teaches you a lot along the way. Yeah. Yeah. It, well, it's important to, to look at things from different. And I think that's where a lot of trainers and the, the, I, I have kind of a contention with people doing stuff to be famous. Like there's all these people, TikTok, which I got off of because I couldn't. And Jan, oh, I, I can't say, right? TikTok, like Janice, like, why are you on TikTok? I said, I don't know. They told me to do it. One of my social <laughs> media people. And it's like all these women shaking their butts. She goes, why are you looking at this? And I said, I'm not. I don't, I don't look at any. I go on Facebook literally and I go to my thread. I might wa watch one or two of your things. But that, I don't know what's going on on Facebook. I don't know what's going on on Instagram because I just go to my page. I want to see if my post went through, who's sure. watching it, who's asking me questions. But I don't understand all this. But th there's so many people getting into it for all the wrong reasons. Mm -hmm. And they want to be famous. They want to be an influencer. They want to be this. They want to be that. I never started out that way. And I think that's what drew me to you because you're raw. And, and your videos that I watched, yeah, I can tell they're shot on an iPhone. I'll tell you, one of my almost million view videos was shot on iPhone. And you have a couple million view yeah, videos where yeah. you shot on iPhones yeah. and the audio sucks and stuff. <laughs> but you know what? It's real information. Sure. You know, and that you can't replace that. You can't replace that with brilliant camera work. Right. Well, yeah. this is what I tell people. You could criticize me. You don't like the way I do this. You don't like to do that. But I can put my dogs in any situation up against anyone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so when I came here today, I've gone to hang out with trainers before that I respect and like. And it doesn't take me long to get very disappointed mm. when I see what they're like behind the scenes, mm -hmm. when I see what their dogs are like. But the thing that I loved so much instantly, all four of your dogs were at the door greeting me, <laughs> being normal. Yeah. You're not yelling at them. You're not telling them to go place. Right, right? Like right. they're just family dogs and yeah. they're, all, they're all active high drive dogs. Yep. So right away that I love. Then when it's feeding time, watching what you do with all four of them, mm. that's dog training. Yeah. And that's the stuff I, I really love. Yeah. So you could disagree with how I do this or how I do that. But... My dogs, I'm very proud of mm -hmm. what I could do with my dogs. Yeah. Right. And 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 so that's what's always going to be important to me. Well, you know what's really important to me too, on top of that, is that you have a passion for the dogs. Like I've seen so many well trained dogs and 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 and, and bad dogs, but it, just because your dog is well trained doesn't impress me. What impresses me is how do you love that dog? Sure. And that's why I dropped out of IPO. I mean, I was doing it. I, I loved the training and I loved the relationship with my dog. 
but he wasn't really goofy. He wasn't really cut out for it. He wasn't as hard a dog as I should have had. And most people in the sport replaced the dog, right? Sure. And Frank and I talked about that. He wouldn't. Like, now I, I really admire that. He gets a dog at an older age and sometimes he'll get a puppy. But he and I kind of got that. And you know who else got that? It was Danny Craig. Danny breeds his own dog, keeps his dogs. And he really has that nurturing side. And I'm not saying anything against any other people I've had, but you have that side where you just, I mean, you're like a big teddy bear. Like you're just like a softy. You, you care. You have that compassion. And um, that's, that's missing, Right? Because I think that goes a lot further. It's it's not about if your dog can do the sport or if your sure. dog is a great dog. Like Maya is a nice dog. She's got she's great with anything I teach her, but she's not bright, right? But I love her unconditionally. I would never think about rehoming her or getting rid of her or, or, or looking down on her. And that's I think something we share is that you kind of care more about the dog than the big picture. The dog is the big picture, right? Hundred percent. Yeah. Uh, I built the business on my dogs being out in public, mm -hmm. you know, before e-collars, never on a leash, downtown Nashville, I'm going in to get a sandwich. I mm. like sandwiches, mm -hmm. obviously, right? <laughs> and and my Rottweiler's sitting outside waiting for me, mm. and people are looking like, Who's, whose dog is this? My dogs are crazy about me. Yep. I don't force that. I yep. love my dogs. Yep. Like, yep. My, my whole family is big part of my dog's life. Mm. And they're never, uh, I'm a very light-handed trainer. Not not saying I won't get on my dog for doing stupid things, sure. right? But I know I'm associated with e-collars, whether good or bad, Yeah. right? But if people saw how often my dogs had an e-collar and they say, wait a second, maybe we're doing something wrong here because mm -hmm. you don't see them on my dog, Yeah. right? It's built through that relationship. And I'm still getting better at that. With each dog gets better. Mm -hmm. You know, Dante, my German Shepherd that I am, going to attempt to do IGP. I'm mm -hmm. sure there's plenty of people that hope I fail miserably. And I, and I may. <laughs> I doubt it. I'm thinking you're going to make it. But um, he's a phenomenal dog. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But you don't see an e-collar on him. You yeah. don't see me teaching him anything with an e-collar. Mm -hmm. You know, me and that dog play every single day. I don't necessarily train every day. I probably should be. Mm -hmm. But I guarantee you we're playing together every day. He's yeah. chasing a ball every day. We're playing tug every day. You know, we're doing cool things together. Mm -hmm. And he's nuts about me. He's a, he's a year old. And yeah. he's going to get more crazy about me. Because, you know, what, what impressed me about him the other day, I was even surprised by this. I'm outside playing ball with him in front of my house where everyone sees on the videos. And the young girl across the street was walking her doodle. And she went around the cul-de-sac. And as I'm playing with him, she came over by me. And her doodle is going crazy. You know, Dante's not on a knee collar or nothing. He's not on a leash. Mm -hmm. And I'm waiting to see what he does. He's around interesting things all the time. But mm -hmm. this is like right up in his face. Mm -hmm. He didn't care. Mm -hmm. Like, he didn't care that anyone was around. That's the kind of stuff that, that's a win for me. I'm like, we're doing good here. Yeah. You know, because yeah. when he's so in, to, hey, come on. You're going to throw the ball? What are you doing talking to this girl, right? right. Let's play. I'm like, that's awesome. And I, I sent my breeder, Terry McCormick, I, I sent a message that day. And I just... I said, Terry, I'm so grateful you bred one hell of a dog because yeah. he really is. I just don't want to screw him up. That's yeah, my yeah, goal, right? Yeah. Well, a lot of that comes in, in the, into play where I talked about it, and Avi and I are going to do a podcast on it. It's just this genetic thing. Um, just an interesting thing. I want to talk to you about it. I see a lot of times, for example, I've dealt with some really stubborn dogs in the shelters, and I think personally, and I, I'm, I'm very open to you contradicting me and, and trying to and re explain your point of view if you have a different one, I just think so much of dog behavior is genetic, right? I mean, you can have the best pit bull or the worst pit bull, right? But if it's a genetic behavior, and if people always say, well, you don't like pit bulls, you don't like Rottweils, you don't like this, you don't like that, or Akitas or Sharpays or whatever. It's not the breed, it's the genetics in yeah. that dog, right? And so when you deal with an issue with a dog, what do you, how do you explain that? Like, do you think it's, if it's a genetic flaw, can it be, fixed or solved or anything like that or do you just say it's it's very genetic sure i don't think you can't fix genetics or genetics you can't change it mm -hmm. right i think you can manage it to a certain degree mm -hmm. um, i was talking to you earlier about an evaluation i did with a really serious separation anxiety case mm -hmm. right and i went over there to expect to tell her listen they've been, the dog's been going through this for six years wow like bad destroying crates walls doors windows so I expected to go there and yeah. say, listen, this dog is so genetically whacked out. I can't fix this. That's honestly what I meant to do. Mm -hmm. And after being there for two hours and seeing some really interesting things and truly enjoying that part of being in someone's home, mm -hmm. seeing the dog in their real environment, it's priceless for me. I don't believe 
none of it's genetic. Mm -hmm. I really don't. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, I don't think it's the dog they called me for. I think it's the other dog creating the problems. Mm -hmm. I'm almost certain it's the other dog creating the problems. And I think if I could have had a camera on us for those two hours, it would have helped so many people to see what you could do. None of it had to do with obedience. Mm -hmm. None of it had to do with Mm e-collar or corrections or commands. It was all behavior and really paying attention to what the dog does and doesn't do. But more importantly, what the owner does. Mm -hmm. What's the behavior of the owner? Why are these dogs like this? And so in that that two hours told me so much. So when I get back home after this trip, I'm going to take that dog and keep it for a day or two, maybe longer. Mm -hmm. Who knows? Just to see if everything changes when the dog's with me Mm. and I can't guarantee it, but I think it's going to, I really do because I don't think it's genetic. I think it was created. Do do you think, because you keep going back to the e-collar thing, you got this reputation because I saw one of your first e-collar videos. I was impressed. I liked it. Um, and I liked your approach to it and it really, I guess it's because it kind of like ties in with things I've done and stuff like that. Do you think that you got kind of labeled as this e-collar trainer yeah. as a slam to you or as it, I mean, like, do you think people said, oh, he's just an e-collar trainer or both? Or you do both. I got a lot of praise mm-hmm. from what I was doing with the e-collar. Good. But of course, then people are going to assume even anything good you do is e-collar based. Right. It, it got so bad at one point that I wrote an article. I'm not that e-collar guy. Uh-huh. And the reason I wrote that is I was at a, at a working dog week at a trial one weekend and my wife happened to come with me, which she never does. And I had Luca with me, my Malinois. Mm. And for that whole weekend, my dog was the only dog who was never on leash, never had an e-collar on, and I worked the crap out of that dog on purpose mm-hmm. in front of everyone. Uh-huh. And at one point, my wife said, like, why does everyone keep referring to you as that e-collar guy? And it wasn't in a negative way. Okay. It was in a positive way. Got it. But it even annoyed her. Like, mm-hmm. is that what they think you do? Because my wife sees. I don't have e-collars on my dogs, right? Mm-hmm. But after a while, I learned not to be sensitive. And I said, okay, if that's what I think, then I'm going to show a different way. I'm going to show a better way. Because there was a, a stretch for a year or two where I was making a lot of negative videos. I was speaking a lot. They were very negative. I think I lost a lot of followers, too. The reason I was doing it, there were a few big name trainers, YouTube trainers mm-hmm. that were getting very popular. And I think they were doing so much harm in the dog world. We yeah. talked about it earlier. Yeah. That bothered me. Yeah. I didn't want to go out and start using names. So I would just talk about things that I found to be wrong. Mm-hmm. But I went about it the wrong approach. I just was bitching about it and being very negative. And after a while, I saw this isn't helping anyone. It's Mm -hmm. not helping the industry. It's Mm -hmm. not helping me. It's not helping the average dog owner, right? So I said, I'm going to take a different approach. And instead of saying all this stuff is wrong, like some people still do, Mm -hmm. I said, I'm just going to show what I do. Then give people the option. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to tell you my way is the best way or the only way. But here, this is what I do. But then you watch my dogs Mm -hmm. and you watch the dogs that they have in their care. Yeah. You tell me what you want. And that was the best thing I ever did because that's when things really started blowing up. Yeah. You know? how, do, how do you handle criticism? Because I know I get it a lot sure. and I'm sure we're, we're right around the same place. I mean, I think sure. you and I share a lot of followers, a lot of theories, a lot of similar things. When people criticize you and like, you know, acute, like you said a great thing. Oh, you, you know, you can only do what you're doing because of the e-collar. And I've had people post on my stuff. You can only do what you're doing because the e-collars and prong collars. Well, 90 percent of the videos i have up have no e-collars no sure. prong collars people want more e-collar stuff and prong yeah. collar stuff but i just don't think we need it i think through luring and shaping and good relationship yeah. and, and engagement we can fix that but how do you handle because most of it when it's if it's true i don't i've got no problem with it and i really have very little problem when it's not true but how do you handle it when it gets kind of personal like when people start insulting you and getting close there was a time when it used to bother me it did it, mm-hmm. it would really bother me because in my mind i was thinking why would they think that like, that's mm-hmm. not what I do. That's not what I'm doing. I, I didn't teach that. With I've watched people watch videos of Luca, who who's a very impressive dog. That dog hardly ever had an e-collar on. Mm-hmm. And I've seen so-called professional dog trainers, as you could tell that dog was taught all of that stuff with e-collar pressure. And I just laugh. It shows me how <laughs> little you know. Yeah. That stuff used to bother me, and I used mm-hmm. to want to try to convince people. Not now I can care less because... As we said earlier, I'm in such a good place now. Mm. If you're spending your time watching my stuff, you're a fan. Mm -hmm. And you have nothing positive going on in your life. 
if I'm used in your course, you have a giant ego and low self-esteem, mm -hmm. and I have something that you want that you can't achieve. No matter how talented you are, mm -hmm. that's going to ruffle feathers, but it's the, it, it's the truth. Mm -hmm. So I'm done giving respect for people that don't show respect. Good. And so I don't care who you are. I yeah. don't care what your accomplishments are. Mm -hmm. If you want to be disrespectful, it's going to come back at you. But you got to be careful mm -hmm. because I'm a very nice guy. I'm a very sensitive guy, but I could, I could be the opposite mm -hmm. too. And I'll treat you right. But there, I only go, I only have so many, pa so much patience to deal with that. You know what I mean? My, my wife sees that stuff. My kids see that stuff. Yeah. That's what bothers me because they get upset yeah. because they know what the truth is, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I, get, I mean, Janice sometimes sees some, she goes, well, what do you, why would they say that? And I said, because I think you and I are going to attract a certain clientele because who we are. Sure. Um, I, I shouldn't say clientele, but a certain, a certain criticism um, because I think that's how they feel they can tear us down is on a social media platform from behind a keyboard. I think in person, they mm -hmm. wouldn't come up to our face and say that. Sure. Um, and I don't, you know, I always look at like, what have you done? What have you done to prove other, I mean, it's the first thing Janet does now is she just clicks on their thing and they've got like three videos about, you know, flowers. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> There's no dog, anything yeah. in there. And I don't mind if you criticize me, if you have something constructive to lend. But I, I went to this place where I said, you know what, if you, and this came from a, a, an old person, a, a person I knew years ago who said, you know what, if they're spelling your name right, that's all you should worry about. Yeah, that's great. Right? But if you engage them, then you're giving them, yeah. like I don't engage. And I'm, this is where I'm really, touched and flattered and i think you have the same thing is as soon as somebody criticizes me if i don't if i take it down i'm doing a disservice i think you you have a right to your opinion and if you don't agree with me i think you have that right i don't feel i have the right to go on your page and criticize you sure but some people feel they have that right and okay we still have some kind of free speech in america not much but you can criticize me on my page but i guarantee you can have 50 people who stick up who have actually watched my methodology who have followed it and work and i think that's what happens for you too right people come back you up out of the out of the blue. Yeah, listen, I've had people just like you have literally make videos about me, put them on YouTube, put my name in the title mm -hmm. because they get 13 views on their videos. <laughs> yeah. Like literally. Yeah. <laughs> but now they put my name in it and everyone goes after them and they get 4,000 views. Mm -hmm. And I tell these people, guys, I appreciate it. I really do. Mm -hmm. But you're giving them the attention they're looking for. Sure. They're not going to get attention on their own merit, on their skills, on their accomplishments. It's not going to happen, Never. but you're giving it because attention is attention. Clicks are clicks. Mm -hmm. Dislikes are no different than likes, likes. <laughs> when it comes to YouTube <laughs> right. and, yeah. and Facebook, right? It's, yeah. it's all the same stuff. Yeah. And so those, and if you watch the people that literally make videos and talk about other trainers, I've tracked this. I've paid attention to this. Mm -hmm. They all have a lot in common in their business and or personal life. They don't have a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. people who are happy and content and successful don't spend their time following people they don't like. Yeah, it it doesn't happen. Successful people don't do that. Mm -hmm. Miserable people, jealous people do that. You yeah. understand? That's true. It's true. It's sad. It's really, it, it's really a sad state. But, you know, you think about it. I mean, you and I are not social media kind of guys. I mean, we've, I've been very blessed. You've been very blessed. I mean, you, you, you know, you have a lot of talent. I think I have talent too. But I think this is such a foreign world to who we are at, at the core. It's just not my, I hate it. I mean, I, I detest it, but I do it because I think so many times I've said on Facebook, I'm out, I'm not doing this anymore. And the people say, no, please. And I think about there's a, a space that you and I fill, and I'm, I'm very proud to share it with you because I like you as a person besides as a dog trainer, um, that we bring something to the table that I don't, I don't know anybody else who does in the pet world, especially, and in the troubled dog world, because sure. you've dealt with a lot of troubled dogs too, that I've dealt with in the shelter, and I've been unpopular in shelter work also, but you fill that space. How do you handle that? Like that's a huge responsibility because most people out there are either clickbaiting stuff, they're, they're, um, they're lying about what's in the videos, um, but I think you have this raw quality which really helps people and you're able to address in a way where people like that. That's a big responsibility. Like, what do you think of that? Like, what do you do with that? Like, how do you handle it? It gets exhausting. Right. And if you've watched lately, I've really eased up on social media. I just needed a break. Mm -hmm. um, when there's so much overload going on in your head and you're constantly thinking of something, I've never been one to post content just to post content. Mm -hmm. Right. And I've posted everything 
I could possibly think of every problem. If I have if I have five hundred questions on the same subject, mm-hmm. that's when I'll talk about it. I'll make mm-hmm. a video about it. Like mm-hmm. that's that's what I do because you can't respond to everyone right. anymore. Um, I've seen a ton of criticism about talking videos, car videos, right? What people don't understand, mm-hmm. there's a reason why that ha- how that happened. And I've talked about this before, but they don't ever see everything all the way through, right? Right. So what happened was my phone went off when I was driving one day. It was a comment on a YouTube video. And it was a so-called professional dog trainer out of Ohio, I believe. And she started telling me what she was doing with the, the e-collar. And she started telling me about the dog's response. And it was brutal. Like, it was outright dog abuse. And I couldn't type fast enough while I was driving. I literally pulled over on the side of the car and I made a video Mm. response and I posted it. And I told her, you're abusing. This is outright abuse. Put that tool away. Don't ever go near it again. That was the first video I did. Well, it kind of blew up. And I talked for a while and people were really into it. They said, can you do more of that? Talk about this subject. So I did another one Mm -hmm. and then another one because people kept asking. But the people that run their mouth about me talking. (laughs) I do talk a lot. I get it. Mm. But you have to understand something. You have a lot of followers that ask questions. I have a lot of followers that ask questions. We're trying to help people that Mm. can't maybe afford help or have access to help. Yeah. So these are things that a lot of people struggle with and want to hear. But the giant egos don't get that Mm. because they're not going to do anything for free. Mm -mm. If they're going to do anything, they're going to charge you a fortune and they want to keep it a secret. Mm -hmm. And if you care about dogs as much as you say you care about dogs, then you would try to help more people without charging an arm and a leg. And I'm not saying everyone has a right to make a good living. Absolutely. You know what I mean? Go out there and kill it. Make a million dollars a year training dogs. Sure. But with that, I said it earlier, I've never been hurt by giving things away for free. Me neither. Never. You know, and if I hit the Powerball tomorrow, I'd be training dogs all over the world for free. Mm -hmm. Just loving it. Yeah. Because when you do shit for free, no one can bitch about it. It's true. It's true. Yeah. <laughs> There's no it's pressure. True. It's true. You know, the, I saw you on one chat, and and I I dis, disdain people who try to trap people up. And I think you know what I'm talking about. I'm not going to get. Yeah. I'm, I'm not mentioning any names on yeah. this show, right? I mean, we could, but I'm not going to. Um, and it it really hurt me personally to see somebody trying to trap you up. Cause I know you come from this really pure place. You really want to do the right thing. Sure. And you give your information. You're like me. If you want to know how I do something here, here it is. Put it all on the table. Um, so many of these trainers, whether they're doing seminars or, or online memberships or whatever they're doing, they're just trying to give you just enough information to get you in. Mm-hmm. And you know, on my YouTube channel, I mean, I make no mistake about it. I make my living from my, my, my membership section, not my YouTube channel. But, um, I give them enough information that if you go through YouTube, you can solve your problem. Sure. Now, if you really want all the detail, okay, I'm going to charge you membership because that's just how you do your seminars. I do my, my membership, but you really give it away and you put it out there. And I think it's a, it's a, it's an important part because so much of the information is, you know, you're watching a 40 minute video on some of these people. And, but when you get to the end, you're like, I didn't get, I didn't get, I, right. w- w- I just wasted 40 minutes of my life. Right. And you can really, I always think, I think dog training is so damn simple Mm -hmm. i mean i think it's the easiest thing i've ever done i mean of of all the things i've done dog training has been the easiest because if you just put yourself in the dog's position and try to see how is the dog understanding what you're trying to say that works and i think that's your approach or am i wrong do do you look at it with that simplistic it's so simple anybody can do this 100 percent, right almost always yeah there's difficult situations but when it comes right down to it you know i see people getting dogs with issues and right away they're jumping in trying to teach the dog obedience and do this and do that and fix that. I spend a lot of time doing nothing with a dog Mm. and guess what happens day three, day four, day five. When I go out there, no matter what the dog was like with me before the butt is going, the tail is going. Now that's my dog. Mm -hmm. Now that dog knows I'm its person. Now things get easy, Yeah. but people are trying to force the issue way, way too early, way soon. And the, and the conversation you're talking about, Oh, I still, get messages daily Good. about it daily. I knew the way that conversation was going to go mm-hmm. when I said I would do it. You did? Oh, yeah. Okay, I did. Yeah, 100%. Okay. No one else was stepping up, right? Mm-hmm. And when that whole thing took place on social media and the, the ugly conversation started, I kept going, please don't see my name. Please don't see mm-hmm. me. And then my name started popping up. 
Mm-hmm. So, okay, I'll have the conversation. And I knew how it was going to go. Okay. And I was told maybe I shouldn't do it because it's going to hurt me. Well, I don't have a problem with that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because if I lose everyone who follows me, now I get to train my own dogs and be with my family. So I can't lose, right? Mm. But I didn't think it would. Mm-hmm. After the conversation, I thought it was going to hurt the other party. Mm-hmm. And I literally sent the text when I was at my one of my seminars because of a conversation I had with someone else, and I was going to tell them, don't post it. Mm-hmm. Not on my behalf. Right. Because I think it it wasn't going to be pretty for the other side. I, I agree. And I wish I would have said, don't post it. I do, because it, it wasn't a good light. Mm-hmm. And I think it created a lot more confusion in the industry on the tool. Mm-hmm. And uh, it didn't hurt me. In fact, it, it kind of did the opposite. Mm-hmm. You know, I had so many people, high people, mm-hmm. reach out and say, the way you do it, has has made everything we do much better yeah. doing it that way. You know yeah. what I mean? And and I don't care how you want to do it. Sure. But I guarantee you, I could literally I literally have tens of thousands of messages from all over the world. Mm-hmm. And here's the thing that bot this is the part that bothers me. I didn't invent anything. Mm-hmm. I didn't create anything. It's not the Larry Crone method, right? right. I just learned from people better than me mm-hmm. and made it my own. Mm-hmm. Why am I the one singled out? when there's some very high power world-class dog trainers out there in the, in the working dog side, very successful that do it the same way. How come they're not called out? Mm -hmm. Think about that. Yeah. Why am I the one still called out? What is your obsession with me? Go after this guy who's been on multiple world teams, Mm -hmm. go in this guy who's like world famous as being the one of the best to ever do it. Mm -hmm. But no, you come after me, the little old pet dog trainer. Come on now. (laughs) It doesn't make you look good. Mm-hmm, you mm-hmm. know, it hasn't lost me anything. Right. Because the the people that were anti-Larry were going to be anti-Larry after that. Right? The people who were pro that side were going to be pro that side. But there are a lot of people out there in the middle. I didn't get hurt by that. No. Believe me when I tell you. No. You know? I mean, I thought you came through shining. I mean, I, I was very proud of you that, that you that you did it. You know, but it it showed me again. I, I I have issues with this whole scientific dog training thing. Sure. Huge issues with it. Um, like I said to you before, and, and a friend of mine told me this. He said, you know, if you had taken notes in your twelve years and all the few thousand, several thousand dogs you've been through, you would be the best scientific dog trainer in the world. But you know, for me, experience is more important, and doing the job is more important. And and I think that's something that people miss in dog training. They they follow these these book ways. Yeah, and and to be fair to that, Robert, that pushed me further into the science mm-hmm. because I I wasn't anti science, mm-hmm. but I was very people don't care about science. But if I see I'm lacking in an area when I couldn't answer certain questions, right? Mm-hmm. But I'm honest about so I'll say I can't. I don't know. I don't know why that happens. But mm-hmm. I'll say I won't make something up. Right. But the good thing is that did push me much deeper into the science and Mm. I actually got an interest for it. But the further I got into it, I understand why that conversation went the way it did. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it made me even more confirm that I was doing the right. And and for a second I said, okay, I'll be, I used to do it that way. Mm -hmm. I used to do it that way. No different. The same way that I said, why I was doing it wrong, it should be done this way. Mm -hmm. I used to do it that way. And I could tell you when I started doing it this way, because of other people showing me, the results were a thousand percent better. Right. And especially with all dogs, Mm -hmm. not just strong working dogs, not just dogs with, you know, very, very high drive or dogs Mm -hmm. that could take a lot of pressure. Let's talk about the weakest dogs. Right. Okay, if you just start using aversives with weak dogs, that could be an issue. But if you're a phenomenal dog trainer, that could be an issue, but you can get away with it. Mm -hmm. Now, let's focus on the average dog trainer all over the world. That's where the problem is. That's where the e-collar has suffered for the past 40 years because of the average dog owner Mm -hmm. and still is today. I agree. And that's why I've always taken caution in how I teach people and what I promote because mm-hmm. I know what I promote people are going to try. And the way they do it like me, you're not going to mess your dog up. Mm-hmm. Maybe taking your time, you may do more than you have to do, mm-hmm. but it's safer for the animal. Mm-hmm. And that's what's important to me. Yeah. What, so what do you think? Because I get asked this question all the time and, and I'm so passionate about it. You know, I mean, I know people abuse e-collars. Prong collars, choke chains, crates, whatever it is. Um, 
and I see countries like I talk to people, and I'm sure you do, in England and Sweden and, and, and you, you know, all over Europe, and they, they don't have access to these tools anymore. Sure. Um, what do you think is the answer? Like, how can we make sure that it stays? Because people are going to abuse it, but people abuse rubber bands and put duct tape sure. on their dog's snouts. We don't illegalize rubber bands and duct tape. Yeah. But how do we kind of get people to understand that, hey, just give it a try. It can really be an amazing, I, I think it's an amazing tool you know, especially the way I use it or you use it. And I'm really upset and pissed that people use it in a bad way. I would love to get my hands on those people. But with the exception of doing that, what do we do? I think it's an easy fix. Tell me. Maybe not a 100% fix, but more people have to show the good side of it. Mm. And they're not. You're right. I've done it for years. Mm -hmm. It's not that hard. Mm -hmm. I'm not the best dog trainer in the world. Mm -hmm. I've done seminars in countries where it's banned. Okay. okay. I've dealt with that. Mm -hmm. And when you ban a tool like that, the dogs are going to suffer, right? But you have so many people pushing one side or the other. All you have to do is show people, mm -hmm. right? No one's going to use one of my e-collar videos on the force-free side to try to tear the tool down. Mm -hmm. They're not going to. They can't. I've had people up until like a year and a half ago, right, right before COVID, almost every seminar I've ever done, I've had a purely positive person sneak in to cause problems almost every one wow no one's ever has because by the end of it they'll come up to me and they'll say i was that one person because i'll talk about this now I'll say right. hey, every time there's someone here that comes thinking they're going to see something and they want to rip us up and someone will come up to me by the end and say i was that person That's like funny. i can't believe like i was so again i didn't know the tool could be used but like yeah that. i'm a very small fish right in a giant pond if more people stepped up and showed what it could do instead yeah. of talking about it and ripping each other apart, mm -hmm. it makes it harder for that side to demonize a thing. But if they're going to demonize, what are they going to do? They're going to show a popular trainer who opens a dishwasher, puts a, a an e-collar on a hundred, and when the dog goes near it, holds the button down and crucifies the dog. Mm -hmm. That's not how decent trainers are using the tool. Right. That's right. how scumbags are using the tool. That's yeah. not a dog trainer. That's an abuser. Yep. But that's what they're going to use in these courts when they try to ban the tool. Mm -hmm. So you can come after me if you want, but I'm never going to be the cause for hurting the industry. It's not going to happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just see it so many times that these people, and I, I think pr because of the, we have this 24-hour news cycle, the social media cycle that, you know, when it, if it bleeds, it leads. Showing somebody like you or me or whoever, is, and there's many, many good trainers out there, I don't think that's I don't think that's the meat. You know what I mean? I mean, I think you see that and you go, "Wow, oh, that's kind of good. It works." Okay, blah blah blah. But when you see this dog being fried, mm -hmm. you know, or you see this dog being hit. I mean, why do dog abuse videos get a hundred million views and you know other videos don't? It's emotions. Yeah. So that's that's what's so triggered, right? I mean, that's it's a hard thing for people to to wrap their heads around that this this is actually a, it's almost benign. Like if I use an e collar and, and the dog is just kind of like turning and okay, that's it's working. Sure. It's a tap on the shoulder, not a two by four across the head, you know, sure. but I mean, I would just wish there was a way more people would get that to yeah. see your ways or to see, see the ways where you can actually train a dog with an e-call and use it as a, as a beneficial tool because it can help so many people. Listen, you know? we're, we're working with people that have below zero dog handling skills, mm -hmm. right? I have people that go out and get high drive bird dogs, hunting dogs, they really struggle, mm -hmm. right? They go from really struggling to having dogs run away and getting hit by cars. Like mm. this is like literally happening. Like these are real cases I'm talking yeah. about. Yeah. To being able to take their dog out on off leash hikes. Yeah. That's a different life for the animal. That's a different life for the family. Mm -hmm. And it's easy. Mm -hmm. That's the thing. It's so easy for anyone to achieve. Yeah. But we're more concerned with ripping each other apart or social media followers. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem. I'm never going to be the biggest channel no. on YouTube. Right? I barely post anything on there. Like I hear all the time, like, hey, you haven't posted in two months. You're, I, I'm not doing it to build my channel. Mm -hmm. The videos I put out, I tried to help someone. Right. right? I'm showing stuff with my puppy working along the way and stuff like that. But it gets old and it gets tired. I've yeah. put out everything I think I, I know how to put out. So if I started doing it, now I'm just repeating stuff, you know? But, you know, in that repeating thing, I've done that. And I, I mean, I, I push my YouTube channel. But I think what happens is when you show those things, like that consult you did with that person, you might have talked about this a hundred different times, but sometimes, you know, it's the hundred and first time. Yes. You know, so, I mean, I don't see the fault. And your stuff is always interesting because I think 
you bring a life to it. You bring a good vibe to it. And if there's, you know, okay, maybe it, it worked with this pet dog and this working dog, but not this rescue dog who, who kind of, we approach it differently. Because I think if it was a one stroke approach, then, you know, we would do five videos and we'd be done. Sure. Right. I mean, there's five things you were, you know, I was, those are the five things you should, your dog should do. And I show it's done, but I mean, with all these different things. So, I mean, I think you should put more stuff out there. Uh, I, I'm, I'm trying the wife just said that the other day too, <laughs> you know, she said you, I did a live the other day for the first time in a while. I mm -hmm. just had to take a break. It got old and I was really bad at it. <laughs> I couldn't get the words out. I was like, wow, I'm actually out of, it's either I'm out of practice or I didn't have a drink with me. Right, right, right. right. So I think people drink, think I drink a lot more uh -huh. than I do because of COVID. Mm -hmm. I did so many Facebook lives and so many interviews mm -hmm. and I like having drinks when I'm doing the, the Facebook lives. Right. But I don't drink much when I'm not doing the lives. <laughs> so when test. I stopped all the lives, I'm like, like, wait, I'm down 30 pounds. I feel better. I got to stop doing the lives. That's the wife's like, no, just stop drinking during the lives. I'm like, yeah, I got that too, maybe. You know? I mean, I couldn't even get you to drink. I was trying to get you to have a, a beer at lunch. You wouldn't yeah, do it. And no. Janice was trying to give you tequila the whole time. Yeah, you, you if I didn't have to drive, I would. But okay, I don't. I don't I don't even have one drink when I'm yeah, driving. That's I've got that policy too. I something I've never messed with. I've mm -hmm. done really bad things, yeah. but I've never drank and drove. Never yeah. in my life. I have. <laughs> I have and I shouldn't have never done. I mean, look, I you know, I, I I've it's like what we talked about. I can I'll admit all my bad mistakes. But sure. Yeah, no, it's it's really stupid. I mean, you're a freaking idiot if you do it because you're you kill yourself. It's one thing, but yeah. you hurt somebody sure. else. It's devastating. It's 100%. really really bad. Um, so tomorrow we're going to Gold's Gym. Oh, can't wait. Right. <laughs> um, and we'll try to do another podcast, but I want to kind of talk a little tiny bit more about your whole the underlying Larry Crone, right? Cause everybody knows about your dog training thing. Yeah. Like what, what do you like to do? What are your hobbies besides like, I, I've, I love a million different things, but it's always interesting to find out like the other person, like what's your day like? Like, what do you like to do? Do you like music? Do you like uh, work? I know you like to hunt. Yeah. I'm, right. That's yeah, cool. You like hunting. Um, um, you work out. I have to work out every day. What else? Um, as I get older, I love just being home. Doing nothing. Doing nothing. <laughs> Sometimes at night, I have two recliners. My wife's in one drinking wine. I'm in one drinking bourbon, and we're doing nothing. We're talking, watching tea. It's, it's awesome. at these days, at, at our age, it's the greatest thing in the world. Yeah. Doing things with my kids. My daughter, I don't get to do things with much. She's 16, so she's at that age where <laughs> right. my little dude, I coach his basketball team. We still do a lot of things together. It's the simple things. The easier life stays, the happier. You saw how happy I was today. Yeah. I love going out for nice dinners. Mm -hmm. I love going out to eat. But I also love going to hole-in-the-wall dives. Me too. Give me a, a good Mexican place, Peruvian place, Colombian place, Italian place, anything, ethnic mm -hmm. food. That's the stuff I love. I yeah. live to go out and eat. Yeah. But it's all the simple things. You yeah. know what I mean? And I'm happiest when I'm in my routine. I wake up really early. I get my kids lunch together for school. Mm -hmm. I get my dogs out, I feed them, I do all that stuff. I usually take both kids to school. My wife works a lot. Then my day's free. I'm in the gym in the morning, and the earlier I get there, the more I have just to do whatever I want. Yeah. And those are the days now where I really enjoy retirement. Yeah. You know? you've, you've retired this year, though, right? Yeah, February. February yeah. 25 years. When's your birthday? Uh, January 6th. Okay, so you're Capricorn. Yeah, I was at the... the uh, capital thing that day on January 6th last year. Oh, you were there? No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Someone's going you to did. accuse me yeah, of you're being for there. For sure, now you've yeah. been there. <laughs> no, and yes, I love music. Yeah. Like music, hunting during November and mm -hmm. October, that's my therapy, being in the tree. Mm -hmm. But music, I'm like, I'll get in my truck, kick on the music and just drive the country roads. And, and that's, yeah. that's a little bit of paradise for me. So who do you listen to? Oh man, if you look at my playlist, you think it's a mistake. Mine too. <laughs> like there's everything from Andrea Bocelli to Tupac to Brooks and Dunn and George Strait and okay. the Temptations. I listen, I'm a big Motown guy. Mm -hmm. I love old school rap. I love my country music. Mm -hmm. But I didn't start listening to country music into the mid nineties. And I told you that whole story today. Yeah, but that was a really good story. Yeah. Was, you should share that story. Yeah, that I was, think that's a good one. That, that, that's that how I got, I hated country music coming mm. from New Jersey. Right. You know, the only country music we knew was Kenny Rogers greatest hits because of gambler. Right. Everyone liked that. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> right. But yeah. other than that, and then now like I'm missing my Chris Stapleton concert this weekend. Oh, 
because love him. It got canceled during COVID. We saw him right before COVID. Phenomenal. The best. Then we had tickets for last October got canceled during COVID because of COVID. We had tickets for this October. He got sick. Had to cancel in Nashville. Me and my wife, we had a thousand dollar a night hotel room, non refundable. Mm. We went down and enjoyed the night in Nashville. Good. His makeup date is the tenth while I'm here. <laughs> so I'm really pissed about that yeah. because I love Chris Stapleton. And like I do too. for country music, I'm huge. Brooks and Dunn, Chris Stapleton, Luke Combs, George Strait. Like okay. those four. Yeah. But but lately I've been on a big Eric Church kick. Like okay. I didn't realize how good Eric Church was. Yep. I'm crazy about Cody Johnson right now, who's a newer guy Don't coming know. up. Yeah, phenomenal. Good. Just a straight up cowboy and okay. some good stuff. Just starting to get a little more popular. Yeah. Um, and a lot of the old stuff, you know, yeah. I, I love the, the old, the old David Allen Co. And yeah, David and Allen people Co. back in the day. Yeah. I, I, I love, love Johnny Cash. Yeah, ab- right? absolutely. I got a buddy who, who's written songs for Johnny Cash and David wow. Allen Co. And I told you about that earlier yeah, yeah. today and just, yeah. just an awesome dude to sit down and talk with. Yeah. You know? I mean, that's, it's, I think it's those simple things. Like people always think we've got these really, people always say you should do a video of your daily routine. I'd be so bored. Mine's the most boring routine. I'm mean, I get up, I feed the dogs, I go to the gym, I walk the dog. Yeah. I come back, I'm on my computer answering stupid emails or yeah. like looking at things. I think God, that's, I'm the most boring person in the world. And people always want to see you know, like, what's your daily routine? I could do it in five minutes pretty sure. much. I could just do a quick thing, but you're a pretty private person too, aren't you? Well, eh, or no, it depends. Uh-huh. How so? You, you know, I don't take myself. I, I post a lot of things that are very un non-private like yeah. very inappropriate that shouldn't be my wife cringes because she's the opposite right yeah my wife won't let me yeah and so i'm i'm pretty out in the open because of uh-huh. social media but i don't take myself serious yeah and when you do that sometimes you post things that your wife gets really upset with you about like <laughs> listen i was on a security detail a couple of years ago at the un the uh the, the big summit the united nation with all the world leaders uh-huh. right ungo we call it um and I was assigned to a certain world leader. And that means you're with him 12, 13, 14 hours a day. You go wherever he goes. Right. And I was working really long shifts. I had day shift, thank God. But at night, 14 days in New York City, I celebrated every night like it was my last night on earth by myself. Oh, wow. And one night I went to Spark Steakhouse. That's where John Gotti killed uh, Castellano, right? okay. big famous. My, I uh-huh. always wanted to eat there, and I went in there. I got I got off my shift. We were at the gala, the presidential gala. I left there, went all suited up. I walked to Sparks, and I sat down to eat. And the history and the atmosphere, I was in heaven. Mm-hmm. And if you ever watch TV shows where they talk about Sparks, and it, I had the waiter that's always on TV on the Food Channel, and we just hit it off. We started talk. I started drinking wine. I started eating. I got toasted because I was happy. I was so happy. <laughs> yeah. Well, I had a long walk to my hotel. Like it was across the other side of Manhattan. <laughs> I decided to go Facebook Live on the way. <laughs> I had a little bathroom incident in New York that I had to get <laughs> off my chest. I had to talk about it. What was it? Oh, man. Anyone who knows me knows I have a lot of bathroom incidents. Okay. I eat too much, <laughs> then I'm running to the bathroom. Well, I had this attack. I went for a walk in New York. And to make a long story short, I didn't, I couldn't find a bathroom. Okay. <laughs> and finally, I find a Whole Foods and I walk in and I try to be, you have to watch the live. Okay. I tell the whole story. I walk okay. in and there's a young lady there and I don't want her to know I have to poop. So I try to play it off. Like, hey, you guys have a bathroom? She's like, yeah, it's upstairs. So I rush upstairs <laughs> and I'm about to lose everything, right? And I get upstairs and I see a bathroom and I go in and there's all these women in line. I'm like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. And I turn, I walk out and some little old lady comes out and she grabs me. She didn't speak English, but she's telling me, no, no, it's for everyone. Oh, I'm like everyone, what do you mean everyone? And so I, I have to go. Yeah. I go in, I'm in a stall and like, there's women all around me blowing up the stall. Oh, it was awful. Like uh, I didn't know women do that. Yeah, no, our wives don't. And it, I was devastated and I'm trying to be quiet because I'm so embarrassed <laughs> and I didn't succeed. But apparently in New York, it's all genders together bathroom. Since when? I don't know. Wow. But I was devastated and it happened more than once. And 
I started talking about this on a Facebook live. And as I'm on the live, I'm seeing there's a lot of people and my wife is texting me, get off the live, <laughs> shut it down. And I'm just going and going. I don't even know where I'm talking to people, but I had such a good time. And it just That's popped funny. up the other day. And I had people say, every time that comes up, I watch the whole thing all over again, you know? <laughs> it's one of your memories. Yeah. So, so I'm never going to take myself too serious. You know, yeah. life is very short and I laugh a lot. Yeah. And I'm an obnoxious to my wife and kids, but I do <laughs> screw around. Sometimes yeah. I, I go a little too far, yeah. you know, but I like to have a good time. I don't get away with it. I mean, I tried, you know, I was that guy. I, I did that. I was really obnoxious, but I, I were off color. But Janet kind of pulled me together on that one. Yeah. She's like, you can't really do that. And she's, and I'm glad. But I, 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 was, I was like that. I would always do those off-color things. And then I realized, okay, I'm not going to do it. That's the one thing I really sacrificed for her because... I think it's important. Our right? wives are very similar. Are they? Yeah. Yeah. yeah very yeah, similar. Yeah. I think they are. I think it's pretty funny. Very much so. Yeah. Well, next time you come out, you got to bring your wife. Oh, she'd love it. You know? She'd just want to drive around in your, your <laughs> wagon there. Man. She's, well, she'd get along good with Janet. Yeah, It'd for really sure. Be fun. Um, we should fun. Um, we should try to do something live before we do our podcast tomorrow. Sure. Something like that. But um, let's plan on going to Gold's Gym. Oh, yeah. Let's get a bite now. You're still hungry? Look, I'm getting a pump just thinking about oh, it. Oh, yeah, yeah. You look like it. Yeah, totally. <laughs> um let's uh let's get a bite to eat and uh we'll, we'll continue Whoa. this tomorrow yeah, if dinner's on me no no, no. Well, dinner's, we'll, dinner's there's it's non-negotiable it's not negotiable i'm not eating <laughs> larry, larry's not gonna eat no nope. we, had, we had a fight over lunch we thumb wrestled over lunch we did all right um this is so such a cool chat i mean we had so much to talk about today we should sure. have had a camera following us around yeah, i think it would have done really well Great. But um, let's uh, let, let's hit uh, hit the restaurant. Get something. If we think of anything else, we'll, we'll do a quick live in the restaurant. Let's do it. All right, cool.